Let's uh, welcome the team from the Pediatric Heart Network. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be presenting our project, Establishing Effective Clinical Practice Guidelines for Advancing Congenital Cardiac Care. My name is Dr. Michael Gaze. I'm a pediatric cardiologist and intensive care physician from the University of Michigan. And I'd like to set the clinical setting for our project for you. We're going to talk today about children with congenital heart defects. This is the most common birth defect in the United States, affecting approximately 1% of all births. That means about 40,000 newborns are born each year with congenital heart defects, and about a quarter of them will require surgery or an intervention in the catheterization lab within the first year of life. Now, most people are familiar with diseases that we can see, like cancer or Down syndrome, but the truth is that this is the leading cause of death from birth defects in the United States. So this is a major public health problem for children, and it also greatly affects pediatric hospitals because this is a high resource utilization cohort of kids. Now, taking care of kids with congenital heart disease is an incredible honor and a privilege, and it's very rewarding for us. We take kids with diseases that are incompatible with life, and based on advances over the last three decades, we can give most of these children a fairly normal childhood. So we really enjoy it. But that being said, there's still many challenges and barriers to take care of this population. These children have diseases that are really chronic diseases. Even if we give them a good fix, it will impact their life from the day they're born until the day they die. And it, they have health problems throughout the lifespan. So we're always looking to be better. The problem is that finding solutions for improving outcomes are complicated. And we're going to get into the depth of this as we move along in the presentation. So this is a look inside a pediatric cardiac surgical operating room. And I'm not lying when I say that this is really a matter of life and death. The difference between a good operation and a bad one is literally millimeters. You can see that this is a technologically complex environment with many different providers from many different backgrounds. In this slide alone, you can see surgeons, nurses, anesthesiologists, and cardiac perfusionists all working in an exquisitely choreographed orchestra to provide the best care to the patient and to get them through it safely. And what you're seeing is only a small part of what a child goes through to have cardiac surgery and then recover from it. When they leave the operating room, they go to the intensive care unit, and then eventually the step-down unit in a hospital before they go home. And over that time, literally hundreds of providers are going to touch that patient. So to make this system work efficiently is a daunting task. And as you're going to hear in this presentation, we have focused on making that system run more efficiently. What you see on the right of this screen is a child coming back from the operating room with a breathing tube in connected to a breathing machine. Now, the transition from the critical phase of their illness to the more convalescent phase and getting them home really comes with removing the breathing tube or the process of extubation. And so you'll hear that term throughout, but this is what it looks like. Providers taking care of the child, making sure they can breathe on their own safely, and removing the breathing tube. And this represents a major milestone for a child who's undergone cardiac surgery, again, transitioning out of the critical phase of their illness. So we've done great work in improving outcomes for children with heart disease that require surgery over the last three decades, but we still have more work to do. There is an extensive body of literature showing variation across hospitals and outcomes, not just for mortality, which thankfully is low these days, but in terms of complication rates and longer term health outcomes, quality of life and functional status. And there are a number of different reasons why that's the case, some of which we know, most of which we don't. The environment differs from hospital to hospital. In general, these are large academic pediatric hospitals, but they have different facilities, resources, staffing patterns, and organizational structure. We have no idea how these impact outcomes. There are different care processes. We're all trying to get the same result, but we go about it different ways. We use different medications. We use different equipment. And again, we set up our units differently. And of course, there are human factors, the skills of the, of the providers, the amount to which they focus on this population that vary from hospital to hospital. So these are complex teams of care providers, physicians, nurses, pharmacists, nutritionists. The list goes on and on. To get them to work together efficiently, as I said before, is a daunting task. 
Of course, individuals make contributions and their skills make contributions to the outcome of a patient. You need a surgeon who can do a good technical operation. But we have decided to focus less on the individual and more on how teams uh, can provide care. To date, within this large, complex clinical environment, there have been no studies that really analyze all of these components together, the resources, the care processes, and the staffing patterns. So we felt that it's important to study practice variation as a means to optimizing care delivery, both quality and efficiency of care, and to encourage collaborative learning for broad quality improvement. And this is certainly consistent with the Institute of Medicine's concept that systems-based approaches are a most effective means for improving healthcare and outcomes through collaboration. So with that, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Gail Pearson from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute to talk about the past, present, and future of research in congenital heart disease. Dr. Pearson. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So like Michael, I'm also a pediatric cardiologist. And when you have the privilege to take care of these patients, you also really appreciate the importance of the federal investment in research to help improve outcomes for these fragile children. So it's fortunate that this year we're celebrating the 70th anniversary of the founding of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. The National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute is one of 27 institutes and centers that make up the National Institutes of Health, the nation's largest funder of biomedical research. When Harry Truman signed the National Heart Act in 1948, the purpose of the then National Heart Institute was to address the emerging epidemic of heart disease that was appearing in the post-war era. However, even from the beginning, the then National Heart Institute awarded grants to support research in congenital heart disease, including one to this man, Alfred Blaylock, seen there in the center with his arm over the chest of a small child who was so ill because of her congenital heart disease that at age 15 months, she weighs about the same as she did at birth. The year is 1944. The setting is an operating room just north of here at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Dr. Blaylock is about to make history by repairing for the first time a complex congenital heart defect called Tetralogy of Fallot, which you'll hear more about later because it's one of the conditions we studied. In 1944, there was barely any adult heart surgery, let alone heart surgery for children, and therefore there were no tools. So Vivian Thomas, one of Dr. Blaylock's assistants, actually had to make most of the tools used in the surgery, including the vascular clamp shown below. This was a real turning point in congenital heart disease. Now children who previously would have died could be saved. It was such a momentous occasion that HBO made a movie out of it a number of years ago called Something the Lord Made. So in the ensuing decades, there were a number of similar advances, particularly in the surgical field, that helped improve survival of children with these complex heart conditions. However, it soon became clear that in order to make additional advances, what was really needed was a multidisciplinary team approach to further innovation in congenital heart disease care. So how to do this? This map is purposely blank. I didn't leave something off of it. But as recently as the year 2000, there was no national infrastructure for conducting research for these children. The National Cancer Institute had established a national network of cancer research facilities to study childhood cancers, but there was nothing else. So in 2001, NHLBI funded the Pediatric Heart Network. Today, the Pediatric Heart Network is a robust collaboration involving 10 clinical sites, additional auxiliary sites that help us with various studies, led by the New England Research Institutes, and the research team at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Since 2001, the PHN has enrolled nearly 10,000 infants, children, and young adults in a multitude of studies that have provided uh, data about uh, data to improve outcomes of care through studying medical and surgical treatments. Because of the success of the Pediatric Heart Network, a few years later, additional consortia were added to this program. The Cardiovascular Development Consortium is meant to study the, the molecular underpinnings of normal and abnormal heart development, and the Pediatric Cardiac Genomics Consortium is looking at the genetic causes of congenital heart disease. 
And together, these three consortia form the Bench to Bassinet program, which is the ultimate in team science because we're doing research across the spectrum from basic to clinical and across the lifespan. So what are the objectives of the Pediatric Heart Network? First and foremost, to improve the health outcomes of children with congenital heart disease. We disseminate our collaborative findings. We train and educate new investigators. We provide support and advocacy for families. And indeed, several patient advocacy organizations have joined forces with us to help improve our studies and help us answer questions that they're most interested in. And finally, we conduct large definitive studies that inform clinical practice and meet regulatory requirements. I put this slide up in case you want more information, which you can find at our website, but also to remind us that if these children had been born 70 years ago, only two of them would still be alive in this picture, and the other two would have lifelong complications from their disease. We've come a long way. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Eva Lee, who's going to talk to us about how Operations Research joined forces with the Pediatric Heart Network to improve care. Thank you, Gail. With this, I want to take us to the journey on the operations research side. And as Michael has mentioned, we want to take advantage of the system side. We want to be able to see all these data and be able to really analyze them and see what outcome we can improve. This is a mixed model that involves a lot of different types of of data, and we spent one whole year looking at it in great detail, collecting this information and trying to understand them. Armed with these seas of data, we like to be saying that we are buried by the data, but we also like to be able to find a way out of these data. We try to apply and advance operations research techniques, and this involves machine learning, network inference, network, as well as the simulation and optimization. All of these tools are working together, hand in hand, not one over over and dominating anyone. With this, we find out some critical factors and we provide these to the clinicians subjecti or objectively. And that really embarks the whole concept of collaborative learning. And this involves a hundred of clinical investigators. They work very hard trying to understand these key factors that come out from the operations research team. What do they mean? They focus on these and looking at the type of outcome that they would expect and trying to build consensus across all these institutions and trying to figure out what is the best way to implement these tech techniques. It is very important. We might have great ideas coming out, but if we cannot implement that, then it would not work. Then with this one, these all these objective as well as subjective analysis go all together and come up with the consensus clinical practice guideline. And you will hear this word, CPG. It is the clinical practice guideline. It is very commonly used in the hospital. And that is what the doctors actually follow this guideline step by step as they actually provide care. And we are talking about not just one provider to provide care. We are talking about hundreds of providers every day go in and out to take care of these individuals. And with this, not only a CPG, but also how do you implement it successfully across not just one site, but all the sites and be able to measure the outcome. I think the challenge of measuring outcome is at every single meeting, no matter where we are, everybody asks, how do you measure outcome? Clinical outcome it is extraordinarily difficult to measure. And we are very fortunate because we have the New England Research Institute. The data scientists there actually are the one that develop the data protocol and also the monitoring protocol. That means every site is able to collect the data according to the protocol and be able to really understand what are they collecting and follow all the guidelines. And with this, it embarks the uh, implementation step. And most importantly, after the implementation, we would like to know how do we assess the outcome, the quality and the care? How do we measure the, um, the outcome in terms of different metrics? How do we analyze, is there any cost benefit there? Or are we increasing cost because we improve the quality of care. That could happen, right? And then we also like to know, what is the compliance rate? Is it a success that people actually make changes? Can they sustain this change in the uh, different settings? So lots of um, advances here. And I am going to summarize just a few of these. As many of us know that this is a very complex problem. And I think we are very fortunate because it is so complex. It really offers us a lot of advantages in terms of advancing the field. So what you see here is the machine learning capability. It's a multi-group machine learning. 
capability where you can first analyze this patient and separate them into multiple groups. And at the same time, you can also put some of these individuals into reserve judgment. What does that mean? That means they don't belong to any groups. And that happens, right? It is really important to be able to do the second stage of analysis. And you see this time that the really the crux here is the multi-stage, not only that you can do multi-stage, you can also do it in many different groups. It's very powerful. These accommodate many different types of patients' characteristics, different types of clinical surgical procedures, different processes that they are actually uh, using, as well as different types of medications. And innovation, why right, there is also a lot of the theoretical part. This is the model, the only model existing is still the only model in existing where it has a very nice property simultaneously in a single model. And I think machine learning is really popular now, trying to attack back big data. But the key is, can you find those important information out of the large amount of data? And that is really the innovation here. Then there's the inference network. Inference network, I think every one of us is very familiar with it with the last 10 years, where lots of um, social networks generate a lot amount of data and what you're looking at is inferencing how can i inference you it may be symmetric that means we both have the equal inference of each other we don't have the same inference uh, clearly sometimes right mathematically it's really simple to to state simply a graph with all these individuals and the networks and each of the arcs connecting different inference with probability different and if i give you k i want you to give me the set of notes that gives me the maximum expected inference. Why is this important in healthcare? If you think about HIV outreach, if I would like to be able to outreach to those individuals that are high risk and be able to provide them with like certain care, I would like to find the individuals in the community that has the most inference. And I would like them to be the one that actually do the outreach program. So what did we do is that these are very difficult problems and combinatorial and probabilistic nature. And what we did for this work is that we advanced it further. Instead of just human or knowledge that we are actually connecting, we are connecting all the processes, all the decisions, the medications, and the really every single possible things that happens in the clinic. It is a gigantic problem, yet it allows us to provide the connectivity. That means if you make one change or multiple change, what exactly do you see? How do you see the out outcome along the chain is going to change? It's extremely powerful. And of course, it is a very challenging problem for us to actually solve. And we develop some heuristics to get this problem rapidly in terms of the solution process. So we started one year of the site visit, as I mentioned, starting in 2011, and then rapidly learned that within that we can visit four, site, four other sites and within six months obtain all this data and perform the OR analytics. Then the CPG, the collaborative learning started in the uh, early 2013, and that the development of the CPG was completed and the implementation started in the middle of 2014 and the first year of clinical trial completed in the middle of 2015. And now the practice has become routine practice and that we will expand this to the uh, nationwide dissemination in the uh, later part of this year. And now if you look at metrics, it's complex. Trying to understand metrics itself, and these are not just mathematics, right? These are real metrics correspond to the status, how the babies actually really are at that stage. And here we look at total length of stay. We also look at the time of mechanical ventilation and looking at the type of heart medication here. But ultimately, it is the ability for the mother to be able to hold the child and touch the child. As you see in the first picture that Michael show you, this is typical. It's that the babies are surrounded by all the tubes. There are so many tubes. The first time when the students went to the OR with Dr. Mayley and they were unable to see the patient. We saw 10 people surrounding the patient, a tiny little baby, and she was only eight days old. And so if you think hard about it, it is really a challenge for us to be able to even observe. We can't see anything, right? Because the patient is so tiny, but yet we must see it and understand what are we looking at and how complex it is. So length of stay is a good surrogate mathematically 
because it gives us the concept of calculating, and it also gives us a driving force in terms of like in the optimization process. But remember, it's it's only one of the outcome. So the idea is, what is the greatest flexibility that we can allow, but yet ensuring that we can get the best outcome and also the best length of stay. Right, so we understand the practice variations, but we would like to be able to identify the smallest set of change that gives you the best impact. So this is the very important part. Understanding whenever you introduce any change, you may introduce errors also. Then we must have all the standards and guidelines and protocols to safeguard that, so that we will not introduce errors, and that they are able to implement it, and they can follow these, and that the training is easy. Understanding, you cannot just train one person. You're going to have to train the whole team, and that the training is ongoing and for the longest time. So some of these baseline findings, and and I'm going to tell you a lot of findings that we see in the in the OR analytics, and I will just illustrate a few of these here. Is that we see a lot of the risk factors across patients that are quite different. We look at different、uh, prospect of the pro-operative planning and the knowledge, and and also the operating room. OR here means surgical ward, okay? And basically, we look at the surgeons. How are they doing? The type of knowledge they have, the skill set, will they be like are、uh, so critical to the to the key outcome, and how would they influence the outcome itself? And then we look at the post operative care, which is the focus on this talk. It said the personnel, the composition, the decision. When do they make decision? What type of attitude they have? How do they communicate with each other? How do they hand off from? Once one、uh, time to another time with different groups of people coming in, and how does the family involved in this entire process? So this one is a picture of fifteen hundred patients. In the x-axis is just the label of the patient ID. In the y-axis is the length of stay, and the color is just coded according to the five sites. So you can see the length of stay is quite different across different sites. Then, as I mentioned, we want to look at the team science versus the individual. And this is the surgeons, and we look at the skill set, the knowledge they go in, and how does it influence the outcome? Now, it is very interesting. One can say you have a bad surgeon, and then the outcome is bad. But these surgeons are outstanding, unbelievable how good they are. So it is not that one person is going to make a huge difference. It is the entire team care providers that will make a big difference. So. I have an extraordinary large map, and that has like many, many, many of these boxes. And this is going to just show you. This is just within like several hours of the baby's life. How many medications is being、uh, delivered to this baby, and the process that is delivered. And so within that entire process that we look at, the from the beginning where patient admitted to the end when they discharge, it has millions of these notes. And that is the inference network that we have to solve, and that is the simulation that we have to come up with in terms of the optimization process. So the machine learning have to dig through this gigantic system and find the smallest set of nodes. And basically, now it finds seven particular. Factors, and we use the Gini coefficient. The Gini coefficient basically measure the the、um, differences between the the values across a frequency distribution. If it is zero, it means everybody is the same. So you can say, okay, all the income is the same. If it is positive, it means that factors has more advantages over others. So we find seven of these factors, which is great out of the millions of these, and trying to figure out what is important, what can we do, and so now we got. Three top ones, and we want to know: Can we use any of these, and can we recommend these to the doctors? With that, then the, we discover that the time to extubate give us the best advantage. Why is that the case? Because when we look at the inference network, we discover that if yellow here is the time of ex to extubation, it inference a lot of factors. Here, what you notice is that it inference every of these outcome. That is really very important. And I would like to introduce now Dr. Meili. He is going to describe all the clinical guidelines and everything, and the success of the implementation. Thank you.、Uh, my name is William Meili. I am a pediatric cardiologist at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta and Emory University. So early extubation is the component of care we really wanted to focus in on. It offered several advantages. 
it, it lent itself to an improvement in care. We were actually able to see at one of our institutions, they really seemed to have mastered this part of care, and we thought we could potentially translate it to other centers. Uh, and it would require a team or systems-based approach. Moreover, we thought in a short period of time, it could influence some important clinical outcome variables that are we could measure and translate into meaningful uh, metrics for our patients. Those include things like the time that they're on the mechanical ventilator, the time they're in the intensive care unit, how long it takes to remove all their tubes and lines, when we can start feeding them, which is critically important for a young child, uh, how we can reduce their exposure to harmful medications, and reduce cost. So we had the good fortune in our network of having one of the sites that had really pioneered a practice of extubating children right after the operation. Uh, and we can call this center A for this purpose. There were several other centers, four other centers, that were not as advanced in extubating children early. And this is not uncommon in medicine that we come across this. Often, this cannot be very easily translated to here because medical centers have their own cultural uh, signature or DNA that does not easily translate from one to the other. Uh, and the reason is they have structural differences and ingrained practices that are hard to break. So really, in our mind, the breakthrough here, the collaborative learning component was we were going to try and take this practice from one center and spread it to four other centers. How did we do that? We actually took medical teams, multidisciplinary medical teams, and flew them around the country. We're a national network. We took teams, flew them from Atlanta to Texas, Texas to Utah, Michigan to Philadelphia, and that's very difficult to do, taking a clinical team out of their usual work and flying eight, ten members to spend several days to watch how other institutions work. We thought that was the only way we could really translate practices from one center to the other. Just sending it in text format was not going to work. So we're fortunate within this heart network that Dr. Pearson described, we had five sites that were very interested in this. We also had five sites that we intentionally kept out. They were our natural controls. We didn't tell them actually what was going on in this project. We just wanted to see what happened to them over the same timeline. Among these five sites, we had one that was a model site that really had mastered this early extubation, and four who we were going to try and bring into that practice. So we developed the clinical practice guideline, we changed practice, and we measured outcomes before and after that change. So what were the goals? The goal was to develop this clinical practice guideline. This is going to be the roadmap to how we got these four other centers to achieve better care, shorter time on the ventilator, early extubation. Our goal was to get the majority of kids extubated within six hours of coming out of the operating room. We focused on two operations that I'll show you in a second, tetralogy of flow and coarctation of the aorta. And we wanted to see in a 12-month period after this CPG had been implemented how it did. We gave centers three months to kind of learn how to do it. So the two operations we want to focus on is something called tetralogy of flow, which Dr. Pearson had mentioned, so-called blue baby, where they have a hole in their heart and a small valve. Without surgery, these children get bluer and bluer with time and ultimately die. So typically, at around four to six months of age, these children undergo open heart surgery. Part of the reason we chose this procedure, it's one of the more common procedures with a generally predictable course. The other operation is called coarctation of the aorta, where the blood vessel that goes from the heart to the body is narrowed. Without surgery, the children can die within the first several days, weeks, or months of life. They typically get operated on in the first month of life. So it created two different patient populations that would see how this clinical practice guideline played out. Well, this is the clinic, clinical practice guideline. It's lengthy and detailed, but I just want to highlight a couple points. Again, this is our roadmap to tell centers how to get the patients extubated. It was developed by consensus. Importantly, it tells the anesthesiologist how much medicine to give, but really importantly, it looks at things like intensive care unit system readiness. We believe in a systems approach. If the ICU was not capable that day of taking care of a child who had just been extubated, they wouldn't go down that pathway. Uh, and then also the patient, how they react to this is important. We look at their blood gases and how their uh, body responds and whether they should keep going down this pathway of early extubation or not. So how do we do in our effort to achieve early extubation? So what this is, we have five sites they're labeled randomly here. We had a model site that was our guide before. Before everything started, that model site was able to extubate earlier, immediately, over 70% of the patients, the blue period. Everyone else was down in much lower ranges. After the clinical practice guideline, the other centers basically got no, achieved or, or approached the model site with early extubation rates going from less than 10% in some centers to above 60 in others. So a dramatic uh, and, and somewhat unexpected degree of uh, improvement for our centers. This is expressed in a different way. Rather than what percentage of them had the tube come out early, the question is how long were they stuck on a ventilator after surgery? And this just shows that at one site, on average, the kids were stuck on a ventilator for uh, a, a day and a half 
before the tube came out. After this clinical practice guideline was implemented, they were down to less than an hour. So remarkable improvements by sharing this knowledge from a one model site. But all four of the active sites showed a dramatic reduction in the time on the ventilator. Remember the model site was already there and as expected they stayed roughly where you'd expect, uh, expect them to be. How about other clinical variables? Just taking the tube out by itself is probably not a success enough for us. So we also found that we were able to reduce the amount of time that they needed sedation or pain medicines. Uh, we were able to feed them at an earlier time, which is uh, both physiologically important and allows a child to bond with their parent. Uh, in an era where we focus a lot on medicines, opioids or pain medications are really a staple of cardiac care. We were able to reduce significantly the amount of opioid medication they needed to receive after surgery, uh, as well as the other pain medications and their ICU length of stay collectively shortened. Again, this exceeded our expectation. How, about, how does this translate into costs? So in our centers, on average, uh, the two different operations, coarctation had an, a cost. This is not what we charge. This is actually the raw cost to deliver the care of $56,000 at our baseline. And the coarctation had a, a raw cost of $44,000. What this study demonstrates is a, a reduction in cost, uh, over $13,000, for example, for the Tetralogy of Flow Group. So a dramatic reduction in overall cost. Uh, it's pretty unusual for us to implement a change in our field, congenital heart surgery, that has such an immediate effect both on the clinical outcomes and the cost. I don't know that I've ever seen a case where we've reported such an immediate change and improvement in cost reduction. So how do we reduce costs? Well, you can imagine. We take the breathing tube out right after surgery. Uh, so the, uh, the nurses and physicians need to spend less time with the patients. Less medications need to be given uh, to control pain. Fewer lab tests fewer x-rays, and shorter time in the hospital. So these are the components of care that resulted in a significant cost reduction for our population. So to say the least, we were very gratified with the outcome of this project. And we think the impact is significant and will be far reaching. From a clinical point of view, we were able to demonstrate that children spend a much shorter time on the mechanical ventilator. They needed much less sedation than prior to the use of this clinical practice guideline and they were able to feed more quickly. We showed a significant reduction in cost. And one of the other areas that may have perhaps the most important benefit is if you have a child that has a mechanical breathing tube in, a breathing tube and a ventilator, they can't be held by their parents. They're sedated. They're largely immobile. Once the breathing tube comes out, you can comfort them by things like feeding them, holding them, and bonding with the parents. So these have uh, rather important uh, implications for the en entirety of the care of the child. So Dr. Lee is just going to uh, consider ways in which this may spill over into other components of healthcare. Thank you. So this is very interesting is that we apply this um, approach uh, to other setting and from the really the congenital heart defects to the setting where the mothers that are going to deliver babies and they need injection of pain medication. And the clinical trial was carried out on 4,000 babies and working in a hospital that delivered the most number of babies in this country. They delivered 20,000 babies. And so one trial is like done. So basically it's very exciting because we actually reduced Use the opioid medication by 20%. And the mother is really happy. And the, of course, the hospital is really, really happy because that really, you're talking about the impact of like 1.3 million, like of this new birth, uh, every year. So I think it is really, really, really exciting. And, and it's also funny for my students to see first the little babies that is in the operating room that you have to operate on. And you know what? The next thing they went in and they look at the delivery of the baby. So it was a quite eye opening and understanding how rewarding operations research can be. We are also very lucky in terms of being able to look at these and really thinking about an operations research incorporating operations with clinical knowledge and data and how you can put these into really practice and improve and address the pressing healthcare issues. And now new clinical trials are in the uh, process. We expand these to even a bigger population. So the blood transfusion population, including both pediatric as well as adult, as well as the infectious disease. I think this is really a, an extraordinary example that, that shows what all operations research can do, not just we alone, but actually along with the clinical knowledge. So the scientific advances of this project, in some sense, is really exciting. Because of the complexity of the problem, it gives us the capability to analyze 
analyze a very complex model that arise naturally in the clinical setting. This is the first time also being able to use this collaborative learning in a pediatric cardiac setting. So pediatric population is fragile. It is difficult to actually change the process rapidly and actually seeing results. And I think we are very grateful to be like part of the team. And I also think that this is really wonderful. Before this study, we do not know what CPG is. And uh, we hear that all the time in the clinical setting, but none of us know what that is. And we thought it was the DNA stuff because it's the CPG islands that I know of epigenetics. But the clinical practice guideline is the key to all the clinical trials. And this is the first time the operations research is really used in terms of like providing objectively this information so that the clinicians can diverge all their energy and focus into those critical priorities that we set forth and being able to get the implementation and the successful outcome that they desire. So I'm going to conclude by, again, just recontextualizing this project in the clinical setting of a cardiac intensive care unit. As I told you before, this is a location in the hospital where we are really dealing with life and death on a minute to minute basis. Every night that I'm on call in the ICU, I'm taking care of some of the sickest kids in the whole hospital, many of whom are at the maximum of what we can support in modern medicine. And therefore, our inclination as clinicians is to devote our resources and our time to those sickest patients, like the one you see here with multiple tubes on heart-lung bypass. These are the kids who rely on individuals being at the bedside constantly, making decisions to guide their care minute to minute. But in our ICU, there are still many, many other kids who are moving through with simpler heart disease, like the kids we talked about earlier, who need a system that will manage them while I'm spending my time at this child's bedside. And that's the real barrier, is how we divide our resources in an ICU to care for both the sickest patients as well as the kids who need to be moved through. And this is where I think operations research really shone, shine a light on our practices and our culture in our ICU in this project, which is that it could overcome these sort of natural inclination and barriers to create a system of care that would continue to run even as our attention may be diverted so that these children had their breathing tube taken out on time despite what, what else was going on in the ICU so that they can get that great outcome like my child uh, who I took care of in the lower right smiling with his brother here and have what we're all looking for. So there, there clearly seems to be applications for operations research and the collaborative learning that we used in this study to attack other problems in pediatric and congenital heart care. We have kids now, a growing population based on our success of surgical outcomes with advanced heart failure. They're going to need new interventions to prolong their life and give them the quality of life that we're seeking, implantable pumps called ventricular assist devices or heart transplant. So there are more complex conditions with multiple teams, again, taking care of patients and making literally thousands of decisions on them that operations research could be applied to help improve their outcomes. And the reward is substantial. But don't take my word for it. Listen to that, the words of a mother with, that, with a child with advanced heart failure who was cared for at one of our member institutions in this video, which we've obtained permission to show you. Tyler was born with a congenital heart defect. We had anticipated that at some point in his life that he may need a heart transplant, but certainly not this early. He went into rapid heart failure this spring. He was very sick in our ICU and really facing certain death. Historically, we would have had no options to be able to effectively treat his heart failure, but our surgeons were able to implant a ventricular assist device in him and support his circulation while waiting for a transplant. The physician took something that, first of all, was meant for adults and put it in a 27-pound child. And then, instead of putting it in his ventricle, they put it in his atrium on the right side of his body instead of the left side. So everything they did was essentially not what it was meant for, and it works beautifully. That's allowed him to survive and thrive, and hopefully he will uh, soon undergo a heart transplantation.
Thank you very much for the opportunity to present our project. We look forward to your questions.